Hey guys, welcome. This is Doug Sperling. We're at Sperling TV, episode number three. Today I got three great questions for you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about nutrition, about injuries, and then there's a myth that I would like to uh, reach into and kind of and kind of bust that myth. So we'll start with that. I had a question from one of our clients uh, from Liz, and she asked the question of uh, Does muscle weigh more than fat? And that's a, that's a very common question that we get uh, from clients. And the, uh, the shortest answer is no, a pound is a pound. If you have a pound of feathers and a pound of brick, they're still both a pound, but the feathers, you're going to need a lot more feathers than just one brick. Um, so muscle does not weigh more than fat. A pound is a pound, two pounds is two pounds. Where the misconception comes is muscle is much more dense. What that means is two pounds of fat may take up this much room versus two pounds of muscle may take up this much room. So if you look at it as far as the benefit goes, that's one of the many, many benefits of strength training is you're going to build lean muscle and you may weigh the same, but all of a sudden your pants are fitting smaller, your t-shirts feel bigger, etc. because it's not that muscle weighs more than fat, it's that muscle is more dense. So if you look at it, a pound is a pound, but if you had a pound of muscle and a pound of fat, the muscle is going to take up a lot less space. Uh, I'll post a picture in the comments. There's a, a pretty cool picture on the internet that shows, I believe it's five pounds of muscle and five pounds of fat. Um, and it's pretty cool to see how much less room the, the muscle takes up. So hopefully that kind of busts bust that myth for you. Um, next question comes from Ashley, and this one is about injuries. She uh, mentioned that she's seeing a lot more people kind of her age, middle-aged, that are getting a lot of uh, joint replacements, et cetera, and wanted to know if I had any opinion on that. Um, I don't really have an, an exact answer, um, and I, I think that's person to person, and I think that's case by case. I, I would say that, um, one, I would actually argue the, the, the opposite of that, which is a lot of the, you know, back 20, 30 years ago, they were trying, you know, people were getting their uh, hips replaced in their 30s, 40s, 50s, knees replaced in their 30s, 40s, 50s. And unless you have something uh, dramatically going on, most people may not even need a hip replacement or a knee replacement until, if at all, until their 70s or 80s. And most of that comes from just A, uh, awareness and benefits of exercise, um, preventing things like osteoporosis, et cetera. Uh, and also advances in medical technology. People can have uh, an injury and, and can be in re the recovery process is a lot shorter. Um, so my answer to that is, is really, I don't, think that's a, I don't think that's a trend. I think we're actually, uh, as much as the obesity population is growing, uh, and that may have a, a certain impact on joints. Um, my only other thought, Ashley, would be that um, I think my generation compared to your generation is much more uh, active in the extreme world. What I mean is, is cr those crazy people that are you know, jumping off of, of uh, cliffs with just nothing but uh, one of those squirrel suits or whatever, um, and all you know, more of the extreme style sports, that I don't think was around in the 60s and 70s, and if it was, it wasn't very popular. Uh, so the amount of activity, and that's a whole other topic we can look at, you know, the, the amount of sports somebody's playing, stuff like that, overuse injuries, I think is something that we're seeing a lot more of. Uh, that more so comes from doing a repeated motion over and over again, like, for example, playing a sport year round. However, to answer your question, my guess it would just be kind of luck that that's what you see in, in your friends. Uh, I do think the medical technology has advanced so much that if, if in fact, somebody does need a knee replacement or hip replacement, their recovery process is, is much shorter. Um, and I think as much as the obesity population is rising, the amount of, um, the amount of injuries, I think, is, is actually, um, you know, the joint injuries, I think, is decreasing only because people are becoming more aware of the benefits of exercise and specifically the benefits of strength training. You know, 10 years ago, nobody really knew strength training other than bodybuilding, and now it's becoming more of a, of a, um, of a, a mainstream population is respecting it a lot more and seeing the benefits and not playing into the myths of, you know, women are going to get big and bulky, etc. So hopefully that uh, gave you some insight there, Ashley. Our third question comes from Kate, and this is a follow-up to episode two. So if you didn't watch episode two, make sure you go back and watch that. But this is a follow-up to Kate's question. 
and it was more of a nutrition question and it asked, you know, okay, so I know I need to get protein, but I don't really know uh, how to get it, how much I should be getting and where do I get it from is basically what it stemmed from. The first thing is understanding that uh, protein, I think, is, is, in my opinion, one of the most important things uh, when it comes time to nutrition. I think that um, about a gram per pound of body weight is a good goal. So if you look at a female who weighs 120 pounds, her goal should be at least to get 100, ideally 120 grams of protein. So now you start looking at your day, and like I mentioned in episode two, if you get enough protein, everything else tends to fall into place. The right amount of fats, the right amount of carbs, the right amount of calories in general. Uh, it's amazing if you just pay attention to your protein, how much else, how, how much everything else just kind of factors uh, or automatically happens. That being said, uh, as you start to look at getting those 120 grams, I think the most important thing is to first ask yourself, um, are, are you making sure that it, at every meal, however many meals you eat, which is another topic for another day, say you eat three meals, at every meal are you getting a protein source? And then ask yourself, is there something that I can replace that is maybe a little bit higher in protein? So a couple examples, uh, fruit is a common snack great for you, but it doesn't have much protein. So if you're really trying to get protein, maybe you exchange that out for uh, some almonds or something like that. That still has the benefit of a snack, but also has a higher protein. So if you have good quality food and you're still struggling to get protein intake, I would look at exchanging something that may be a little bit less uh, protein with something that's high protein, uh, higher proportion protein, a little bit uh, same amount of calories. So if you go through a typical day, if you're having um, your omelet in the morning, instead of just putting eggs and peppers and onions, maybe throw in uh, some leftover sausage or some leftover steak, um, something like that. If you're a, a yogurt person, make sure you're having Greek yogurt so you're getting a little bit higher protein. At your main meals, um, if you're not a vegetarian, your meat's going to be the easiest way to go. If you are a vegetarian, then you're going to need to start looking into beans and legumes and stuff like that. Um, and then we, we tie back to, again, something I talked about in episode two, which is uh, supplementation. Everybody can benefit from having a protein shake once or twice a day. So if you're getting 90 grams of protein and you're shy 30 grams or 40 grams of your goal, and you have made all the nutritional switches that you feel you can make, then it's time to uh, start supplementing with a protein shake that has, I mean, a good protein shake will have 30 grams of protein. And again, if you're, if you're super on top of your goals and you're still not hitting it, it's not a bad idea to throw in a, a second shake. So maybe, for example, you have breakfast and then midday, instead of having uh, that piece of fruit, you have a protein shake. So it still has that full feeling uh, but you're getting an additional 30 or 40 grams of protein that you wouldn't get with that piece of fruit. And again, I don't want you to take this as fruit is bad. It's just that if, you're, if you're, your number one goal that you're trying to work on is protein intake, you have to make a selection uh, or a choice of which one is going to give me more protein. So I think I'll, I'll post a link. I have a good link of protein sources. I think protein sources, hopefully by now, have become pretty obvious. It's just a matter of fitting them into your day and looking at everything that you intake, is there something that I can substitute that has a little bit higher protein? So again, um, it, it, and pick easy ways to throw it in. So throw it into your eggs in the morning, um, you know, throw it into your, instead of just having a, you know, um, uh, one piece of chicken and then filling up on mashed potatoes, change out the mashed potatoes and have a second piece of chicken that will probably still give you that same full feeling, but uh, also has the extra protein. So guys, those are the three questions for today. If you have uh, questions on the questions, drop them below in the comments, and I will be back next week with some more questions answered. Thanks, guys.